Today's guest is Michelle Boykin. She's the COO at Rackley Roofing Company. So, Michelle, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Great. And, and look back at your, uh, your background. And I know you, you graduated with an accounting. What were your thoughts there when you, when you were graduating, you had your accounting uh, you know, uh, degree? Uh, I grew up as a shy kid. Um, I always kind of envisioned myself being behind a desk, you know, kind of in a corner all day by myself. And so uh, um, I love numbers. I love things being black and white. There being all the rules that you have to follow. So accounting was sort of a natural move for me. Um, I got towards the end of, of my college career and realized that accounting was not what I expected it to be, or at least like you know, being a CPA and sort of that thing. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't even think that I want to do that, but you just get to a point that you're like, you just want to get the paper and you finish it. So that was my, sure. that was my plan the last couple of years. Yeah. So you got me curious. You said it wasn't what I envisioned. What did you envision uh, what it was and what was it when you got there? Um, well, I think that it was a personal thing. My last couple of years, the way that I had to lay out my classes, I went from um, personal accounting to governmental accounting, to corporate accounting, like three classes back to back. And if you know anything about accounting, those are all three completely separate things. So trying to figure out the difference between each of them and trying to keep them straight, my brain was mush by the time I was done. And I think had I done it differently, I probably would have gone in that field. But just the the way that I took the classes, it, it didn't make much sense to me. Yeah. So when, when you uh, got the paper and, um, you know, did you have a plan? Um, when you got the paper or were you just trying to figure it out at that point? I was really just trying to figure it out. I was working in residential property management throughout college. Uh, my husband is a realtor, was a realtor back then. And um, so I was just kind of feeling it out, wanted to see what I wanted to do. Um, didn't really see my worth at the time. Um, and so I was just kind of going day by day. I didn't, I didn't envision a, a real future at that point. Yeah. And then at some point you, you landed in a, a roofing role. I did. So in 08, the market was crashing. My husband in real estate wasn't making any money and I was barely getting by. And uh, so I was looking for him a job and in the paper, you know, because it was back when you actually looked in the newspaper for things. And there was this job and it was one of those things where, you know, sort of the heavens open, the lights shone down on it. It was like, this is perfect. It talked about accounting. Accounting background is great. Uh, speaking Spanish is great. And those are two things that I had just graduated with my accounting degree. I'm not fluent, but I speak enough Spanish to get by. So I thought this is for me. So I took the job. <laughs> and did it, did it come naturally to you as, as you went in the role? Like it, I think it's a, it was a manager uh, office uh, role. Yeah. So um, when I started, the title was office manager. It was really just, you know, glorified receptionist, um, small office where you kind of just do a little bit of everything. And I loved it. Um, admin tasks, uh, helping people out, that's something that's important to me. I don't know if you're familiar with The Working Genius by Patrick Lencioni, but I'm an ET, which is a, a enablement and tenacity. So I like to help people out. I like to see things through to the end. So um, it was a really great fit for me. Oh, great. Um, and then then you got, I, I, I'm assuming you got recruited into uh, Rackley? Um, sort of, uh, <laughs> I worked for, I worked for Curtis at a different roofing company and he left to come by Rackley and myself, along with a lot of other folks were like, Hey, if you ever need my position, I'm, I'm your person. And I bugged the crap out of him until he finally hired me. I mean, I was, I was tenacious. Uh, <laughs> he was well, what was it that, that you really wanted to, to, uh, work with them or the organization is creating? Uh, Curtis, um, how do I explain Curtis? He is somebody who um, success gravitates towards. Mm -hmm. And I could see that no matter what he set his mind to, he would be successful. And so he's the kind of person that you sort of want to hit your wagon to. Um, and I could see that it would be a good move for me. Yeah, for sure. And then I, I guess you started, it looks like you started out in the service department and then you moved up. How did that go? Yeah. Uh, so when we came to Rackley, there really wasn't a service department. We did um, repairs on leaks that, on roofs that we had installed. So they really didn't have a service division. And that was something that uh, really intrigued me and I felt like I could help with. So um, really started focusing on creating a service program here and it blossomed very quickly and we grew very fast. 
And um, I got to, you know, be a part of that entire journey until it really got to a point that I'm an operational kind of person, not a salesperson. And I sort of plateaued. Uh, our, our organization really wasn't growing too much. And so we took our sales manager at the time and put him into a service manager role and he just skyrocketed the numbers. So it's been a great move. Wonderful. And then you, you've moved up um, through that organization from where you started. I mean, um, any tips or things that you did? Because you, you mentioned earlier that you're very shy. So how, how you know, did, did you get to a point where you sort of made a change or uh, what, what helped you sort of move up through that organization quickly? Um, so I was shy as a child. I wouldn't consider myself shy today. I am definitely an introvert. And I think that I've learned the difference over the years. Um, but I think I, I had to succeed for myself. I had to, you know, do things for my own. I, you know, moved out at a young age. Um, you know, I was on my own, so I had to do things. And so there was this need. And um, I think one of the things that I didn't realize was happening at the time is I was sort of inserting myself into all the different factions of the business. So even if I wasn't necessarily needed, I was willing to help out. So I learned different things as I moved along and that helped me in my growth, I think. And also working for a company with great culture helps, um, you know, having Curtis as a boss, he's very empowering, almost to the point um, of, of pushing. So having somebody that's kind of going, hey, you need to go do this or I need help with this. Um, it definitely gave me a leg up, I think. Uh, yeah. I don't think that I would have done it on my own. Yeah, I mean, give me give me examples of things you got you said pushed into that you thought maybe you thought you were, hey, maybe this is a little soon. Um, g- give me an example or two. So uh, there's an organization here in Nashville called Crew Nashville. Um, back when I joined, it was called WCRE Nashville. And it's a, a commercial real estate women. And at the point that I joined, they had been in, in operation for 15, 20 years. I don't know the ex- exact number. And they had never let vendors in. It was only for property managers and brokers. And so they got to a point that they decided to start letting vendors in. And several of the um, several of the ladies that are members said, "Hey, we would really like for Michelle to join. Um, we'd be interested in having her." And he said, "You're doing this." And I said, "I just don't feel like I'm comfortable. Like this isn't me. I, I'm not a salesperson. I can't do this." And he said, "You're doing this." And there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And now I'm the president elect of that group. So I've been on the board since 2016. So. Uh, it's it's been a great move, but it's something that again I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have done on my own, you know, movement there. So I mean, alignment with the right, you know, uh, leader or the team members, those are critical. Absolutely, yeah. You've got to be, you've got to love the people that you work with, and you've got to have people that really want to empower one another. Yeah, and I know you're 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 deeply involved in National Women Roofing. Did did that require push, or do you naturally uh, uh, fall into that? Um, it did take a push, not as much, I don't think, because at that point I had already been involved in crew, so sort of new to that, or, you know, knew that. Um, I met Heidi, and I mean, if you meet Heidi, you want to be involved, so that's something that, that kind of happened on its own. I did um, sort of get pushed into helping create or create uh, a council here in Tennessee, which I did, I created the council here in Tennessee and I used a lot of connections that Curtis had to do that. He was at the time was heavily involved with TARC, which is the Tennessee Association of Roofing Contractors. And so I sort of used that in to kind of get get my name out there and say, hey, we're doing this thing and this is what we're gonna do. And they were great. They gave us free space to use. Um, A lot of the members joined and all that. So I was pushed, but not as as hard, I don't think. Yeah, for sure. So um, specifically with uh, National Women in Roofing, I mean, what, um, for people that don't understand the organization, the aims or or uh, sort of the composition of women in the industry, can you sort of lay sort of the the background of uh, why that organization exists? Absolutely. Um, Let me start with what we're not. (laughs) We are not a man bashing organization and we're not a bunch of angry women. Um, We are men and women members and we're here to empower women in the industry and it's something that you don't think about it until you start looking around the room and you say wait a second why am I the only woman here 
Um, and should I be? And, and so it's something that's helped me along my journey. It's something that's helped our company along its journey. We've grown huge since we've joined National Women in Roofing. And I, I do attribute a lot of that to the context that we've made through National Women in Roofing. Um, but it's a, just a great place to learn and to network and to mentor. I've got ladies across the country that I can call with help and they can call me and, and we help each other out. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of women that I can call friends now that I would have never met before. Um, and not that roofing, I don't feel like it's, it's a good old boy network like it used to be, but I do think that there was a point that it was. and we were missing out on a lot of opportunities there. And I think now with National Women in Roofing being what it is, we've opened up the eyes to so many different companies and, and people to say, hey, women can do a lot and we have a lot to offer. And I think that it's been a great thing. Yeah. Out of all the things that you do, because I know there's lots of events and different things that you, what do you think has worked the best in terms of you know spreading your message and, and recruiting? Um, I think just having a presence at a lot of the, uh, other things that are going on, IRE, FRSA, Western states. Um, one of the things that I've noticed going to certain things is I will meet somebody at a National Women in Roofing event at IRE. And then as I'm walking the floor, I see somebody and I go, hey, and we immediately have a connection now because we met each other at this event. And then we go to the next thing and we see each other. And so then you see other people going, well, what do they have that I don't have? And how do they how do they become friends? And I want to be part of that. So a lot of it is just that networking and, um, and, and just really creating relationships. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, um, these events, many people are very consistent with going to these events. So being able to develop mm -hmm. community around sort of a routine or regular sort of uh, seeing each other is, is, is powerful. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the areas you think or is the organization or you are focused on improving? What, what's the biggest uh, opportunity for improvement? Um, I think for our group as a whole, one of the things that we've been looking at is DEI. Um, it was an area that even for us, I don't think that we realized we were missing the boat on. Yeah. And DEI being sort of just expanded out. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Got it. Got it. DEI. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so we, I remember I joined the executive committee for National Women in Roofing and we were having a meeting and we stopped the meeting and we said, we're a bunch of blonde white women. And not that there's anything wrong with being a blonde white woman, but we're not representative of what this roofing industry looks like. And how can we represent that better as a group? And how can we make sure that other people have a voice? And so that's something that we've really been focused on for the past year or so. And um, I think a lot of people look at DEI as something scary, and I don't think that it has to be. It's really just opening your eyes to people being different than you and seeing that they have something better to offer maybe. So it's been it's been something that I think we've all had to learn through this year. Yeah. And how how does um, someone that's um, not involved as actively involved in National Women in Roofing or things that you're involved in, like what, what could they do to help? Um, first thing is see if there's a local council and just go to an event because you're going to get a lot of um, you're going to meet a lot of people. So you're going to network. You're going to get a lot of information. Uh, the other thing that I would recommend is whatever organization that you're in, join a committee. That's really where things happen. Um, it doesn't matter if you sit on a board. It doesn't matter if you hold the president or the chair or whatever kind of seat. What matters is that you're giving back and that you are you know, making a difference. So, you know, like when I joined National Women in Roofing, I started the council here. And one of the things that we started doing, one of the ladies was involved with uh, Souls for Souls, which is a shoe donation program. And so she took that on and we all brought our shoes. It doesn't have to be anything huge, you know. Uh, so just really getting involved, doing something to help out the committees um, and find something that you like to do. You know, there's lots of different committees in each kind of, like in crew, um, we have a communications committee, which does all of our social media and email blasts. I joined that committee when I started and really enjoyed it. And it led to the next committee that I joined. So just, you know, involvement. Yeah, for sure. Now, just going back to your, your, your growth as a sort of a business executive, and you went from the service department to now the COO, what sort of personal growth or learning did you have to do to sort of move up? Because, you know, th those are quite different roles. They are. Um, a lot of growth. A lot. It's still a lot of growth. Um, I think 
allowing yourself to fail. That's been the hardest thing for me. I'm a perfectionist. So allowing myself to fail has been the hardest. Um, but I do a lot of reading, uh, a lot of audiobooks, a lot of podcasts, and just trying to learn what I can and opening my eyes to realizing that things don't have to be a certain way. That's been big. Um, as I've gone through, if there's something that I feel like would help me progress in my career, I'm asking to do those sorts of things. You know, is there a class that I should take? Is there, um, you know, something I need to attend to help out? And again, I've got a boss that empowering in this that sort of way so the answer is usually yes and um so a lot of education uh, a lot of self-reflection um a lot of personality tests I've done DISC I've done Myers-Briggs I've done working genius all those sorts of things to realize who I am so that I can better serve other people mm, interesting personality tests do you apply those to you know hiring or others because I know there's people have different feelings towards that I, I understand doing it for yourself but how do you find that effective for sort of gauging other people's sort of temperament and fit uh, so for hiring yes we do a uh, disc for anybody uh, really like office level uh, I don't know if we do it for the field yet I think we may do it for some of the positions but it helps to learn like what are the issues that we're going to come across? Because let's go ahead and talk about them now so we can figure out a plan of attack. Because uh, if I know that you are going to have trouble telling somebody no, then maybe we need to put some parameters in place that you don't have to, or that it's an easier thing for you to do. Um, or if you have an issue with, I'm trying to think of another example, um, always getting your way. Well, maybe we need to put a blockade in place that keeps you from doing that. So whatever that looks like for the person, it's, it's really more about how can we, you know, keep you doing well versus, you know, these are the things you're going to fail at, but we too tend to say, well, these are the things that we're going to see some problems. So let's go ahead and fix those. Um, also how to communicate with somebody else. So I am on the disc. I am a high, high, high C. Um, most of the people on our leadership team are very low C's. And so I have to check myself and go, the rule is the rule, but they don't understand that because they want to break the rules and I have to let some things slide when they need to. Um, but when the things are important, you know, make sure that they know that they're important. Um, so we use them in that, in that manner as well. Yeah. And then the working genius is a little bit different. It's more about um, how you work than your personality per se. Um, but it is something that if you look across your team, you want to make sure that you sort of have each area covered. So if you're missing one of those pieces, you might want to look for somebody that has that piece. Yeah. So interesting concept. Um, you mentioned about so the breaking the rules versus following the rules and keeping everyone on track. How do you assess, you know, what rules should be broken, what rules shouldn't be broken as it pertains to organization? How do you approach that? Um, I think that it just comes with time and uh, understanding your business and understanding your team. There are certain things that that may be really, really important to me as a person, but they may not be important to the company. Um, or it may be, you no, know, this is a this is it. You know, for us, safety is huge. So if somebody's outside the flag stands, um, it, it's immediate termination. That is a that is a rule. There's no there's no gray area there. But if you know, somebody happened to be five minutes late to a meeting this one time, I'm going to be mad because that is something that sort of eats at me, but it's, it's not the end of the world, you know, when you're really looking at things. Yes. And I know you run the entrepreneur operating system, so they don't like people that late. Exactly. Five minutes is on time. Five minutes early is on time, <laughs> which but, I love. You know, sometimes, you know, in the greater picture that, you know, we, we can, we can put it aside for a second, right? Right, right. Interesting. Um, what are the, what do you think the areas that you are looking to, to improve for the future? What, what excites you about uh, your future improvement? Um, I think being able to um, sort of, we've been in, a, in such a growth pattern for such a, for, for a while now. And so there's been a lot of things in place where it's just sort of, I have to be the cog in the wheel just to make things you know, continue. And so I think being able to get to a point that we're letting that go a little bit and letting, letting the organization run itself as it should 
Um, that's something that I think is important in the coming years. Um, I also think uh, personal growth is still just so huge. I mean, you can never stop getting better. And so um, usually if, I, if, if I'm reading something, I'm reading something that's going to help me in business. And then I'm also reading something that's going to help me in my personal life. So for instance, right now I'm doing a Bible study with some ladies um, and it's um, the armor of God by Priscilla Shirer. And so learning, learning my blind spots in my personal life, but then that also will help my professional life as well. So um, just always getting better, I think. Do you kind of have an allocation on it? Like here's the business books, here's the personal, or do you just kind of like let your curiosity kind of drive that? No, I usually am pretty um, intentional with that. Uh, now, sometimes like anything Patrick Lencioni can go either way, you know, <laughs> so those I might make more personal than professional, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's a separated thing. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, is there anything that um, I didn't cover that, um, that you wanted to chat about? Um, so we do EOS and for people that don't know what that is, it's entrepreneurial operating system. And so that has been an integral part in our company in the past four years. And I think that anybody that is, if they're plateauing in their business, that's the first place to look. I'm not saying it's for everybody because it's not, but it's, it's been such an eye opener over the past four years for us. Um, it's made a huge difference. And I, I wouldn't say that it, it made us who we are. It really just opened up our eyes to who we were and who we are. Um, but it definitely gives you a language to live by, which is great. Wonderful. One thing that, well, another thing that came to mind is you're out there, you're part of associations, you're speaking a lot, but you're also the, the chief operator. How do you balance those two? Because not every operator feels like they can go out and do these things. How do you how do you make that work? Um, it's a struggle, and I think it's something that we've addressed just based on based on timing. It wasn't supposed to necessarily be I was doing all these things all at once, uh, but that's the way that the chips fail. And so um, it's it's a balancing act of sort of looking at the week and saying this week is dedicated to this organization and I'm not going to be able to do much. And so, you know, Hey, leadership team, I'm going to need help. And they're great at helping out. Uh, we've got some really great folks that work here and, and they do above and beyond work. So it's been great. Um, and then, yeah, this time is carved out for this type of work. So I think it's really just uh, being intentional planning, um, carving out the, the time blocks as needed. Great. It sounds like you, have, you run a very structured um, schedule. Yes, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> give me a, give me an example of your processes or thought process because I know some people uh, have, or everyone has a different way of thinking about it. So I've really tried to look at the EOS model uh, for my own processes, and in EOS everything is on like a ninety minute time schedule. Yeah, you know, well you've got so to back up you've got a five, a ten year plan and then a three year plan, a one year plan, and then you have 90 day rocks and then to do's that are usually within those 90 days. And so I do live by that, but if I'm looking at my schedule, um, even if I know a meeting is only gonna take 15 minutes, I'm probably gonna block out an hour and a half just so that I'm not, you know, back to back to back, which sometimes it still happens, um, but try to, try to be intentional with an hour and a half block. And I think one of the things that I didn't think about when I first started getting really busy with things is the time to travel, um, even from office to office or office to you know business building, whatever. And I would overbook myself. And so giving myself the right amount of travel allotment is, is important. And then especially now with flights uh, being delayed and canceled, extra time. <laughs> yes, yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing your story. It's wonderful hearing all the things you're involved in. Yeah, thank you.